As of the publishing of this episode of the Discuss CLT podcast on August 11th, 2017, there have been 57 murders in Charlotte since the beginning of the year. To put that in perspective, there were 67 murders in all of 2016, and that was a seven-year high. Clearly, this spike in violent crime has people around the city asking themselves, what's behind the trend? To help discuss this, we talk to 30-year CMPD homicide veteran Gary McFadden. In his time as a detective, McFadden has investigated more than 800 murders and closed over 90% of them. He also has vivid memories of Charlotte's most violent year on record, 1993, which saw 129 deaths. In this episode of the Discuss CLT podcast, we talk about the similarities between 1993 and today, what are the necessary steps that the city needs to take in order to reverse this trend, and the importance of community policing in reducing not only the murder rates, but incidents of police brutality as well. RSVP for the next live Discuss CLT event Thursday, August 17th at Lenny Boy Brewing Company on South Tryon Street. The topic is Charlotte Media Matters, and a moderated panel will discuss how the local media landscape has evolved and where it's headed. The event is free, but you must RSVP at discussclt.com. Remember to get in on the discussion by tweeting us at Charlotte Mag and using the hashtag DiscussCLT. Welcome to the Discuss CLT Podcast. The Discuss CLT Podcast is powered by Ortho Carolina. talk to you today uh, because here in 2017, uh, of course, we've had a spike in the homicide rate that the city really hasn't experienced in, in many years, decades even. So uh, we thought we would be the per- uh, you would be the perfect person to talk to about that subject. Well, thank you. Um, I was here when um, the homicide rate went to one, well, it was 1993. We had uh, the longest homicide uh, problem. And so mm-hmm. we were here in the 90s when it was really out of hand. Yeah, and I, I want to talk, I want because we, we'll, we'll get there. I want to first start with when you got to CMPD. What, when was your first day at CM, CMPD? First day at CMPD was actually July 7th, 1982. 1982. Now, you didn't start in homicide, did you? No, I didn't. I started um, on the west side of the city, West mm-hmm. Boulevard uh, Corridor, uh, which, is the, which is west side at the time. Uh, I loved it. Um, I still drive over there a lot to see it change, but the west side was uh, where I started. Hmm. And I want to, you know, start with why you just, you know, when you made that transition into homicide, what spurred that? Was it somebody saying that you have a certain knack for being able to think analytically for these kind of situations, or what brought you to homicide? Well, yes, somebody saw my work product um, in my early years. I I actually work as a burglary detective hmm. for, for five years, from um, I think it's 82 to, uh, no, I'm sorry, from 85 to 1990. Hmm. I left patrol in 1985, um, spent three years in the patrol, and then from 85 to 1990, I spent my time in um, uh, burglary division. And what does that look like, just sort of figuring out what happened and chasing down those leads? Yeah, burglary division was a great thing because... Uh, People, uh, we work commercial burglary, so we call hmm. it we call it SBNL, store breaking and larceny. Hmm. So think of how many businesses was broken into in the '90s and when crack was an epidemic in the '80s, yeah. and people were smash and grab. You know, the cigarettes weren't behind the counter; they were out on a rack, and people would steal batteries. You know, construction was big; construction sites would get broken into. So what that did for me in the '90s is prepare me to talk to multiple people all day long because hmm. when the weekend comes then Friday night break-in, Saturday night break-in, Sunday night break-ins and we get all the break-ins on Monday morning. So at any given time you would walk into your office and have 40 cases on your desk huh. from the weekend. So my area of the city was from downtown of Charlotte. I would say from the Charlotte Observer building. Hmm. 
all the way to Arrowwood Boulevard. Which was a completely different spot at the time. Completely different spot. You had stuff on Tyvola Road. You yeah. know, you had South Tryon. You had all these businesses. So, and the commercial area. So when people leave Presley Road area and some of these commercial areas during the week, they do not come back until Monday. Huh. So when they leave on Friday, all that commercial area, Tyvola Road, 77 Center, Arrowwood, and all around the airport would be my commercial burglary areas, and they would break in. And then the reports would come to my desk on Monday morning. So I'm a, I'm a leader in the homicide division. I see this guy's clearing all these cases. He seems to have a, an ability to analyze these situations. Is that what happens? They sort of uh, pluck you out of there and bring you into homicide? Yes. Uh, we had a... A process. The mm-hmm. process was 125 people apply for it, and hmm. somehow somebody said, we're going to take our chances with this young man. And so that brings us, I mean, it's 1993, Charlotte, what's called Charlotte's Bloodiest Year, right? It was the, what was the number, the official I think number? some people say 129. Yeah. I remember 135. I remember it's being debated. Yeah, because we wrote a, a, a long-form story on it in Charlotte Magazine, and it was Chuck McShane, I believe, yeah. wrote that. And it was so, and, and I, you were quoted in that piece, and I remember I fact-checked it with you. Um, it was one of my first fact-checking assignments for the magazine. I remember talking to you about this stuff, and it's just like, you're reaching back into a Rolodex of cases, that's so wide. It's so deep. And I, I was thinking to myself at the time, what is it like to look at that history and look at everything you've seen? For me, it's great at this point in my career, and I, um, I look for it. I long for it. Um, hmm. I understand where we're going now. Some people can't understand where we're going. Hmm. In 1993, crack epidemic, a lot of stuff was going on. So we're going to blame it on that. Sure. What do we blame it on now? We blame it on now conflict resolution, Mm. people having disagreements, we having a problem, Uh, communities of color and other communities are having a debate with law enforcement, you know, we are bickering back and forth, you know, the Democrats are not uh, getting along with the Republicans, you know, the Asians are not getting along with, you know, the Hispanic, the Hispanic not getting along with Latinos, do you saying, is it right for me to say Latino or Hispanic, all of these things is conflict, Hmm. but do we know how to resolve them and that is the problem that we're having now. And so everybody believed that they know what sparked it, which we all can say what sparked it, but do we know how to resolve it? That's the issue that we are facing now. Hmm. Is there a cyclical aspect to all of this? The things that are, are do, do these things happen in waves? Do the spikes every so many years? What kind of trends do you see in something and seeing it from your perspective? Well, it happens because we have never addressed the situation. Right. And the situation is, for instance, we are sitting in this room. If this room had a ceiling tile and we see a water spot and we ignore it because it's not a big water spot. When we come back next week, it's a bigger water good, spot. Yeah, sure. And as soon as we keep ignoring it, and we all see it, we discuss it, and we all talk about it, but we never do anything about that tile. Hmm. When it falls in, now we want to do something. We are at that point now. Now it's falling in because we don't know what to do. So, Gary, what, what's the tile? The tile is let's have the honest conversations about why I am mad. Hmm. why I am upset, why that it angers me to see things, why African-American mothers are in fear of law enforcement, why law enforcement is in fear of the African-American male of color. Because here's what I tell people, and, and some may agree and not. When we have these conversations in these forums, these are the same people that come to the forum all the time. And these are the same people that talk all the time. The problem is the officer on the street who is going to come in confrontation with that young African-American male on the street has never talked. Hmm. Everybody talks for everybody. You know, we have it so high up that we're going to have all of the forums. We're going to have all the task force. But when you look at the task force, it's the same people that I know what's going to bring to me. We're going to get her. We're going to get him. He's ex this. He's retired this. We're going to get these people. But where are the people who it is going to affect or cause the effect? Um, Someone asked me to come and speak at an event one day, and I said, I'm not coming. And they said, why? I said, I'm going to send someone. When that young man got to that event, he told them, Everybody said he was amazing. He was amazing. He was amazing. Well, he only said things. He says, yes, I went to federal prison. Yes, I served time. But I was a prisoner at five years old. 
And everybody says, how can you be a prisoner at five years old? Well, I was a prisoner in my neighborhood mm. at five years old. Why? Because I heard gunshot. I heard all this stuff. I had heard everything going on, but nobody came and rescued me. So I was a prisoner in my neighborhood. Mm. And, he, and he was real. I gravitate towards people who's been in those situations. Uh, I gravitate towards, tell me why. You know, we do things a kind of kind of in a backwards way. <clears throat> we honor certain people because of certain things. We honor people who, for instance, we honor an African American who broke the color barrier of a certain high school, college, or business. And we will honor them for years. And they will be awarded for years because they made that one single barrier. Well, in South Carolina, where I grew up, that barrier was also broken by three white kids who came to our school, Joyce Morris and Karen Welch. I have no idea where they are, and I hope they, they will listen to me. They were dropped in our school in the 70s. Three white students came to an all-black school. We had no um, teachers who were white or of other descent, all of them were African Americans. What is their story? What, why are they significant? I want to know what they felt when there was no National Guard, there was no police escort, nobody escorted them in, their parents dropped them off in fear, and they came to our school. And for whatever reason, I always tell somebody this, why this is so significant. Me and Joyce Morris watch Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, Thrill of Manila. I have no idea why, but that's significant because that's all we talked about at school the next day. But what is her story? When she talked to my mother years ago, and I never got a chance to talk to her, she says, Ms. McFadden, you know, if it wasn't for your son, I think that something would have happened to us in that school. Hmm. But he stood up that day and said, okay, let me get, make sure y'all guys got this straight. If anything happened to those two girls, they will kill everybody in the school. <laughs> and I said, this, I said, they will kill everybody in the school because there are two white females. Those are the kind of conversation you have to have and talk about, and so we can understand that. Until we have those real conversations, we're not going to get anywhere. Just because you said you have an African-American friend or my friend is black, that's not, a <clears throat> that's not a relationship. When you have these relationships, it is a beautiful thing. We had those relationships in homicide. We joke about color. We would drive up to the scene and we'd say black, white, or Hispanic. We look in the yard and say, that's y'all. Why? Because we don't put plastic deer in our front yard. And we laugh about it. But those break the barriers, and then we can have these conversations. So to hear the words that people get offended by, it's not so bad. So one thing, it's interesting, <clears throat> hearing you talk about, about the history of it, talking about 1993, um, CMPD has been, I know, uh, operating along the general with the general community policing model for about 25 years now, the institute, I think it was under Nowicki in 90, no, it was before Nowicki. Um, yes. It was like 1992 right. when there was this big community policing sort of trend going throughout the country. Um, and, and that was at least based in theory on the idea of exactly what you were talking about. You know, people, regular citizens in communities that p police patrol most getting to know the, the officers on the beat and having some sort of personal relationship with them. That's been a model now for a generation. What hasn't happened? <laughs> you, you, you haven't had the actual... You have the model, but do you have the right people to push that model? When you have that relationship, you have to have that first-name relationship. When I sent this young man to this meeting, this is a man that I know committed a murder. But when he gets out of prison, we have a relationship to talk to me. One of the best, best incidents that I ever had happened in 2015. We had these gangs in Charlotte called the He-Men and the G-Men. And they were, they, were big little, they were big gangs. He was our first gang and the escort crew and the Mustang gang. And some of those are people are serving life pr prison sentences. But when these two gangs came together and called me one day, they said, Gary, we want to stop everything and we're going to call ourselves ex-gang members and we want to help you in the city. I'm like, yeah, right. And we had a picnic in the park, 
Was I nervous? Yes, I have still have pictures of it. But when we came together, two men hugged and they shook hands and their differences were settled, Republican and Democrat almost. And now they're working in the community as the men. Mm-hmm. When people go to prison, I have one young man's coming out of prison um, November 7th. He wrote me from prison. His mother said he's coming out after 20 some years. I called some of the guys that he had conflict with personally and said, I know you'll have a problem with each other because he, y'all were all in the gang, but he pretty much told on you all. But he was the leader of the gang. I said, hey, there's not going to be any problem when, when you come home. That's the difference that I'm settling months in. And I said, when he called me back, I said, yeah, I talked to him today, and he said, we're good. Everything is good. I'm going to get those two people together, and then we're going to form whatever we need to to talk to the kids. But the problem with community policing bringing the helicopter out, bringing the, the, the trucks out, bringing the armored gear, and just kids climbing over it and doing the bouncy bounces at the non-violent uh, rally is not community policing. We do a better community policing here because one of my jobs is to go to the school and have a conversation. Kids are tired of adults telling them and talking to them about rags the riches, they pull their boots up, and now I'm the CEO of the company. Okay, here's what one kid said. Mr. G, if that guy wanted to impress me, he comes back to the school next May and said, I'm coming to the school one month before graduation as the CEO of this company, and I'm bringing one person with me. Hmm. When I leave the school today, five of you all will be employees, not the nice job fair that we have, which you fill out an application and then you, it, it looks good. No, when I leave here today, Five of you will be an employee of that company. Not fill out application. I'm going to hire you today because you have that kind of power. That's impressive. So when that guy is heard coming back to the school the second time, you have the kids standing in line because now you're bringing something different to give to them. So when he says, I'm coming back, I'm coming back now. Every May when Gary comes, he's bringing five jobs. All year long, i got to have my resume tied. i got to have my speech tied. So now when you're mentoring to these kids in your 501 three season mentoring, then you now you have a goal. Prepare your young man for that. But those are the conversations that we need to have, and then we're going to have to have the tough conversations. Imagine I looked at a film that I wish none of you all go and see to um, Detroit. Hmm. Have Have y'all seen that? I haven't, I haven't seen, seen it yet. yet. Yeah. Okay, here's what I did when I went to Detroit. When I when that movie ended, not one single person said one thing. But the time I went to the movie, it was about 40, 50 African Americans, and there's about 12 non African Americans. I watched the non African Americans walk out of that movie. Hmm. About six of them had tears in their eyes because now they understand a little bit better why young African Americans, if you see that movie, which it happened, And these people went to trial, and everything happened. But when you have a a jury of one race going against kids of one race, and you see all the dynamics in there, that movie is not a good... I would say that's, that's, that's a hard movie to watch. But then it's hard because it's reality to the mothers. And until you have those conversations and talk about that, and were you given equal to make it happen... To, so you can pull yourself up. These are the things why people are mad. But So you can have all the conversations and forums all you want, but you'll never get to the problem of why I'm mad. Gary, we um, we do uh, the conversation, or we try to facilitate the conversations quite a bit here at Charlotte Magazine. Obviously, that's why we have the podcast here. That's why we call it Discuss CLT. We have the uh, live events, which uh, you know have gained a decent amount of popularity, great <clears throat> panelists and all that. How... Then, if we're having these conversations and and other forums are also having these conversations, how then do you change that and turn it into action? Well, you, you change it because you have to be honest about it. We, you, you look at how many people are awarded awards every year, and it's the same people awarded. Okay, kids, kids did this to me, and I'll, I'll tell you, it is, and it's not a Charlotte magazine. It's Pride magazine. Pride magazine did a story on um, black. Does Black Lives Matter? It was actually, Does Black Lives Matter? On the front page. Uh, They had an event. 
I wasn't invited. I didn't expect to be invited. I wasn't even said, would you like to come? I would say, did you want to come? Nothing's wrong with that. But here's how the millennials view it. When they saw that magazine and they read it, and we went through it at the school that day, and we talked about Black Lives Matter, they said, Mr. G, see, I told you. They don't even care about you. I said, what do you mean? They're having an event, a Pride magazine gala, and they never invited you. People see that. So then are you treating things equally? And, I mean, it's a lot of talk. But then on the other side, you're talking about African-Americans being shot by law enforcement. That is true. But when Washington Post did a study about officer-involved shooting, the numbers weren't exactly like they thought it to be. In 2015, it's something like 498 people versus 258. Now, the problem is, in 2015, 258 African Americans were killed by law enforcement. 498 non-African Americans were killed by law enforcement. But what does the media portray that is out of hand? So when that is driving the issue, we don't say, stop, that's Let's talk about this. Nobody wants to talk about that. So those are the things that we talk about in America that we have to understand. Then you come onto the side of blue. If you do another podcast and ask the people, who are the people who are being killed by law enforcement? Michael Brown, you know, Sterling, uh, Eric Gardner. Well, then the next time you said, well, name me the, the two officers' name in Baton Rouge. Do they know their names? Name me, the two, name me the six officers killed in Dallas. Give me their first name. Give me their last name. So then law enforcement said, well, you don't care about me. You don't understand me. When you go to these events, look how quiet law enforcement is and the meeting's about them because they cannot speak out. Because if you speak out, then you're a problem. And when you're a problem, then you can't talk about it. So then how are you ever going to move forward unless you say, this is a problem that happened? Sorry, this is I'm passionate about. No, no, this, this one that's, thing. That's why we had you on here. It's good. Absolutely, it's good. and it's and it's it's very complicated too. It is uh, because I, I I looked at some of the figures for um, for Charlotte itself, and since I believe it's since 2004, um, there have been 69 incidents of CMPD officers uh, firing their guns in anger, one or more shots, and of the victims, uh, there were there have been. 22 uh, people who have been killed and 13 have been African-American. So it is, it is a majority of, of African-Americans here in Charlotte, and I, I don't think that's the case nationwide. But also it's, it's the context, that weird confluence of, you know, the fact that, that black people, you know, ha- there has been a history of oppression and racism uh, related to police departments around the country and the African-American community. There's no ignoring that. And and there's also, you know, some some definite, you know, tension and and problems specifically in African American communities that don't exist in non African American communities, and that's something that that there's kind of no dodging that, unfortunately. It's it's not simply a numerical comparison, don't you think? It does, but we have to uh, we have to be honest that both sides can educate each other. Yeah, and we don't want to do that. Here's what I ask police chiefs when I'm talking to them in another city. You went to the FBI school, and you know we call it the Yellow Brick Road, which is outstanding. And then you went to this school, and you got a certification, which is outstanding. And you went to this seminar, and you, you're a member of these things outstanding. Here's what I ask them. Tell me the difference between braids, cornrows, twisty, plaits, and dreadlocks. And what is that? Well, that's the f- most of the five hairstyles that African-American weight wears. Braids, dreadlocks, cornrows, twisties, and uh, dreads. What does it have to do with law enforcement? That's the next question. I've, it never fails. The brilliant chief says, what's that has to do with law enforcement? I said, I'm glad you asked because that's my next thing. He, imagine this. Billy lives in the projects. Marcus lives in the projects. Billy lives on the left side. Marcus lives on the right side. QT on one side, 7-Eleven is on the other side. They wave at each other. One works, one doesn't work. One has a wife, one doesn't have anything. One's a crack, one drinks and, and, and hangs out, they hang out. So they both wave at each other. At 5 o'clock, they're both walking to the store. They get to the store, they, one buys beer, one doesn't buy beer. 
and they get into an argument with the clerk, and they push the clerk and walk out of the store. That call is going to go out. Whatever male, African-American wear, male, wearing a white T-shirt, wearing jeans um, and Air Force Ones, and he has, um, uh, they say that he has a hairstyle, but they're not sure of it. It could be, uh, they're not sure if it's braids or dress, but, but, you know, he's an African-American man. Okay, officer gets there. Both of these guys are walking down the street. Who does he stop? If you don't know, he stops the wrong person. That person has just left his job. He is upset when you stop him. Why are you stopping me? In his mind, you should know that I'm a great guy. I just work, and I'm telling you that I just w- left this job, and, and, I, and you can't get it. That's a confrontation. Hmm. So when you... T- Tell the guy, headquarters, can you ask the dispatcher to distinguish the hairstyle or tell me the hairstyle? Now, most people say that doesn't make a difference. But unless you've been in that situation, then it is a difference. So when we talk about training, we talk about community policing, let me teach you your rights, what your do's and don'ts are, whether you're under arrest or you're being detained. It's a whole big difference. And so we, those are the kind of things that we need to talk about in our community policing forums and then we don't and i think that that uh, i think there's been some um a, a rise in training in cmpd i know chief it, it, putney has has initiated some levels of implicit bias training and other sorts of uh, or other kinds of things to make beat cops more aware of of the sort of lenses through which they see suspects we have since september i can't tell you how many certificates i've gotten that have to take training. And I welcome it because it opens your eye and you you learn more. You know, how to deal with this, uh, how to deal with the millennials. Millennials say, we don't care about Martin Luther. We don't care about nobody else. We're going to do our own thing. And this, and we want it now. We want it fast. And then we're going to tweet it out. And we're going to Instagram it out. And this we're going to form these organizations and nothing you can do. And what happening? what is happening is the old guard is trying to deal with the millennials and try to get them to understand we need to do it this way. The millennials are not listening to that. Who's, who, who's the old guard? Well, the old guard is in every neighborhood because you are a seasoned person who has been doing it, who's been on the ground of battle for so many years, and that you have this so much a clout. And let me tell you why that is so significant if we have time. Mm-hmm. A young man brought that to my attention, and it just hit me. I am 57 years old. I, I don't have a bad background. My parents, my, my parents, one of my parents was a school teacher. The other one had a small construction company. My father has seven, five brothers, and they, they worked. Everybody worked. All of my aunts and uncles are married, so we got this great family. All right? But, you know, in the 70s is the big wave of African Americans coming to college. Every CEO of a company is 50 to 65 years old. Anybody who's running something in African America is either, either in the 50s, we are the baby boomers. So when the baby boomers came and went to college, we had to go, 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 do good for our families to show them we are here, we're going to do good, we're going to make everything happen. You know. And then when I first got my job, I started off here, then I go up the ladder, and as I'm going up the ladder, I made CEO, and I never had time to look back and bring the other generation up. So when I wasn't bringing the other generation up, Gary McFadden, was putting that other generation in jail for problems because guess what? I never went back to get them. Well, here's something. Let, let me just run this by you, speaking as, as a middle-aged white man. This is like painting in broad strokes, perhaps. But here's sort of the generally kind of how I see some of what we're talking about and the root of some of what we're talking about. In the 40s, 50s, maybe into the 60s you had the great migration correct of of you know a million literally millions of african americans leaving the south to industrial cities in the north midwest west northeast and pretty quickly after that the manufacturing economy collapsed and then approximately 10 years later you had the beginning of the war on drugs correct which sent a, a whole number of heads of african american households to prison on uh, on assorted drug offenses, many of them nonviolent. Um, so as a result, we have, uh, in particular, African American communities that have been deprived of an entire generation or two of leadership, and that's part of of the problem and, and perhaps the disconnect too that you see with so many young people and their parents 
today because some of these parents are in their 20s and 30s and they never had the experience of of having a stable head of household uh you know i mean it, so many i hear so many young people <clears throat> talking about how how phenomenal their single mother was in trying to keep the family together but man that's a tough a tough assignment it is um, do you do you agree with that, or is there are there some things that you want would want to fill in in that narrative that that contributes to the sort of thing that we're seeing now? It goes back to, <clears throat> and I'm speaking on it from experience, and somebody can debate it. I never heard the word mentor until now. There was no such word as a mentor in the '60s and the '70s. It wasn't. You, you think about it. You didn't say, well. We didn't have mentoring groups. We had men who engaged with young men, and you had people, that was your responsibility to do it, and you did it. It didn't have to have a 501c. It didn't have to organization. Men were told these boys need to be guided, and they did. All of my teachers in school, they, we, they were our mentors in our mind when I look back at it, but it wasn't the word mentoring, and we didn't have to have this and have to that. It was just their duties. We didn't take that responsibility. What we're seeing now happen is, a lot of communities and people will defend anything some of these young people do. And so when a young person sees that, said, no matter what I do, they're going to defend me. They're going to defend me no matter what I say and do. Well, I'm going to do it because guess what? I'm still going to do it because they're going to defend me in court, in the streets. So I'm going to continue to do it. Well, go ahead. But those are the things that we need to, as I say, check a little and say, why are we doing this? Okay, well, uh, can you be a little more specific? I mean, if, uh, talking about, it, that sounds like kind of permissiveness, lack of discipline. First of all, is that is that something that you see in particular in Charlotte well, or everywhere? Everywhere. And and is there uh, is there a point at which you, you saw that being kind of a generational difference? Well, or? it started when we were having this conflict. I have to, di now some things, you have to say, some things were, people had to defend because it was being oppressed and, and all this happened. But then when we never addressed it, it got out of hand. I want to tell you, if that's what I'm saying. If you look at the movie Detroit, you can see why Detroit went the way it, it did. One person in that movie um, who was with the, I want to say the Drifters or the dr Dramatics, He's, he was going to be the lead singer of the Dramatics. What happened to him at that hotel during that time affected him the rest of his life. If you look at nothing but that, that young man, it affected him. What did Detroit do to counter that, or how did he attack that? I don't know, but it never got to a point where it corrected this young man because he could have been the star of the dramatics as the lead singer, but because he had that incident in a hotel with law enforcement, he withdrew, he withdrew from it. So we need to address that. When we have these differences in our communities, it needs to be the officer and the young man having that conversation hmm. because they never get to talk. We're just talking for them. And then I've told them what you could do, then I'll push you out here. Well, I told them what you're going to do, and they're going to push you out here. And when we did this in Charlotte, we saw tremendous, you know, accomplishments. And I still want that because the chief, we went and had conversations at the table. No guns, no badge, no uniform, no nothing. And we had these conversations, and some of those conversations are still going now, two years ago, hmm. Gary. Before before we started, uh, you were telling a story about uh, a conversation that you had right after Keith Scott, after the Keith Scott shooting on September twentieth, and we weren't we weren't rolling at that time. Could you mind just briefly yeah, kind of re, re go going back over that? I, I had two conversations, and, and one of them was uh, with Greg Jackson, who was with um, He or Charlotte, and the other one was uh, Braxton. Uh, and Keith Scott came. I mean, um, do, after that, it was tense in the city. Um, I didn't really have a big role, uh, and I came out and just started walking the streets and hanging in the streets. And uh, Greg Jackson and his friend Antoine came to the police department with about 40 to 60 people, and they wanted justice, no peace, racist police, and access to come out. And pretty much the blinds in the police department were closed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could hear them. And I came in from the back door because I was just coming in from the city. And I walked in, and then they were talking about somebody said they're going to take down the flag. And, you know, you could see the tension in the lobby with the officers, with the tension outside. And before they collided, I just ran outside and I said, y'all not taking down the flag. And then we got it, me, Greg, and Antoine and some more people got into it. And we argued for two hours, back and forth. Well, you don't know this. Well, you don't know this. Well, you don't know about, uh, 
use of force continuum, well, you don't know about this. And we went back and forth. And then I challenged them. Do you know justice when you see it? And do you know how to get justice? What do you want? We want justice now. When do you want it? We want it now. Okay, that's it. We want justice. That's it. Let's have a conversation. And I challenged them. They came to the coffee shop. We had about five, six other times of breakfast. And now Greg, call me, Greg calls me every day or every week, and we just yell and fuss and argue. And, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, why is this not happening? I tell you, Greg, everybody loves you now. The shine is off of you. And, you know, it, it's good for that moment. And he realized then what the significance was when Greg and some other people came down after the second decision that they're not going to do anything. Talking uh, about the DA not charging right. uh, uh, Brentley Vinson. <laughs> Right, so uh, Greg and Antoine and some more people came out, and we just walked around. And then they looked at it from a different side. Hmm. And he said, is that how we look? I said, yeah, that's how y'all look. You mean that? I said, that's, that's how y'all look. That's, that's what you're doing. You yell and scream and somebody get the microphone, but I said, did anything happen? They said no. And that's when they started to say, I'm going to listen to you, and you listen to me. And, you know, he created the transparency workshop. He created the... Um, um, uh, Greg did? Yeah. Greg, I'm going to give well, Greg... Well, Greg, Greg working, Greg working with uh, my companion at, the, at PDA. I will still give Greg credit for it, and then I'll give him credit for uh, protest reenactment. Greg created He or Charlotte. But all of that, I can tell you 100%, I know because I sit down at all the breakfasts with Greg, and these was his ideas. Okay. I will give him that. And Greg was telling me, I, I met Greg, I guess, it was it was about a month and a half ago or so uh, after a CMPD briefing, and he was saying that um, there were some people in his uh, his apartment complex, Orchard Trace, up off uh, North Tryon, who were worried about attending the Transparency Workshop. And for, for people that don't know, Transparency Workshop is like this uh, kind of compressed version of the Citizens Police Academy where Correct. you learn the basics about how the department operates, tactics, uh, divisions, you know, the, the kind of Cliff's Notes version of the police academy. And um, he was saying that some, some people at Orchard Trace were hesitant to go down yes. to the training academy on Shopton Road because, you know, for understandable reasons. It was either too far or they just felt nervous going into a giant building uh, that was owned by CMPD. So they asked, you know, is there any way for the workshop to go to the apartment complex? And uh, my companion was like, yeah, sure. Uh, but that's something that he and, we, and Greg brokered. We have to together. come out of our. We have to come out of the walls of the churches. We have to yeah. come out of the walls of the auditoriums. We have to come out of the walls of the council chambers, and we have to come out of the walls of our homes. And we have to come out of the walls of law enforcement divisions and come to the streets. And we have to have these conversations. Me and Greg met out on the streets, and we talked out on the streets, and, we, and everything we did. And these are what I call non-traditional leaders. And then when you have these clashes with citizens and everybody, here's the problem. You never gave me a chance to voice my opinion. Two hours, Greg. I'm standing out here all night. I don't care. Now you're tired. Now we're going to get some work. And then I have let you say anything, and you see that I still didn't go away, hmm. and I honored that. Now let's get to work. Meet me at the coffee shop. We have this picture of the four of us standing there. And then all of a sudden somebody went to the park. You call them helicopter. One of the helicopter leaders come in and he wants to help Charlotte and he came and then he calls a rally and everybody comes to see him speak and then they move to the park and I say, see, now now what's the significance of this? Hmm. Going to the park, but he comes in and he has to make this march. And so we got to get the guys together, we got to go out to the park and they're going to speak and they're going to rally and they pump their fists and then he's going to helicopter his way back out and what happened? Nothing. So let's continue to do what we do and you're going to, I warn them, you're going to lose friends. You're going to get upset. And when Greg calls me and have, he's upset, <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful feeling. But he says, you're the psychic. He, 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 that's a joke. I said, he, I said, because we have been down those roads. And, you know, and, but to see Greg from where he came that night, we laugh about it. Hmm. But when I saw his eyes lit up, when I gave him something that he wanted, he wanted something called Winter Wonderland at the press box. In his mind, I want to have kids to come in for Christmas in Disney World who'd never been in Disney World before. And Greg's try to do this himself. I said, we, you can't do that, Greg. We're going to pay somebody out of our pockets, me and Sean Corbett with Cops and Barbers. We're going to find somebody, and we're going to pay somebody to put this on. And they did. But when Greg saw those kids, it was very emotional for him. 
Hmm. And when I saw him, we did Easter, we did an Easter egg hunt. Greg calls me Sunday morning of Easter and said, somebody didn't deliver the Easter baskets. I need 50 Easter baskets. I had to go to all the Dollar Generals or whatever and bought 50 Easter baskets. Then he calls me up in the middle of the day and said, hey, can you go by Party City and get a bunny rabbit suit? I said, I'm going to get it, but I'm not going to wear it. <laughs> but it's when, a good compromise, I feel. But okay. when he saw you're, that, you're dapper, but you're not dapper. No, like I'm not that, that dapper. I can't wear okay. the bunny ears yeah. and the carrot thing in my pocket. You, would, when, look, you would look fly though. I would, I would, I would have, I would have pulled it off. I would have yeah, pulled it I'm off. Sure you sure, sure. But, when he, but when he saw that, that sparked he or Charlotte. That sparked Arthur's trace because once he felt it. So what, what's what's the bottom line here? I mean, what's what's the what's the element that is needed? A true, honest relationship. Hmm. A, a relationship where you can talk to me across the table and I'm not offended in Greg and somebody, I won't say her name because Greg and somebody had a conversation about hair. And the Greg said, I cut my dreadlocks because I get respected. She said, what? He said, but you wear your hair blonde because you get respected. And she never thought about it. And she called me. I said, yeah, you respect it more. And then those conversations are good. So we feel good of talking about white, black, Latino and all this other stuff. And so then when, once we get to that, we good. I have been invited, don't know if I'm going to go, to Columbia. Not Columbia, South Carolina. Somebody says, can you come to Columbia? Uh, Columbia. Columbia mm-hmm. okay. and help me. And so you bring something different to help people. And that's what we need to do. Guys, we're running uh, right up against our time limit here, but we got a few more minutes. So, uh, Gary, I wanted to give you a quick uh, chance to uh, to go ahead and shout out the uh, show that you're working on that you're uh, the the, the uh, focus of called uh, I Am Homicide. Tell us a little bit yeah, about that. How many episodes are you in now? Uh, we are we had 10 this year. Yeah. Uh, we're in episode uh, number seven. Tonight is number eight. Um, so it'll be eight tonight. Uh, we did 10 episodes. The first season, we did six. So we ended, uh, we did 10 this season. It is about my career here in Charlotte, North Carolina. ID Discovery discovered me through an unbelievable production company called Black Fin. And, you know, this guy comes to me and said, me and my friend and his wife have just left this business. I need your help. We want you to do a show. Sign with us, and then we'll go to ID Discovery. Because ID discovered me, and they got this production company, and we started. And it's like working for your big brother. Uh, little brother, because he's younger than I am. Actually, I'm going to do uh, Gino's wedding in September. Mm-hmm. Um, but we started a company, and it, it depicts um, my career here in Charlotte, working all the hundreds of homicide cases, and they are all true stories. And it comes on tonight, Tuesday night at 9 on ID Discovery Channel. And if you want to see copies of it, it comes on idgo.com. And you can see all of those things. But for me, it's a catalyst into the community. Yeah, I want to talk about very briefly about the fact that this is yet another platform for you, right? It and, is. And what is the message that you would want to get across with a television show like this? That we are human. Mm-hmm. Um, I bring a side of it of not the macho cop, not the cop banging on your door. Right. Um, most of the 16 cases that we have is about me getting emotional. Last week, um, it was a transit bus employee who I became friends with working at the transit asking, can I use this room to do an interview? She was killed. Another case was a little girl named Angela Ray. She was seven years old. Um, she asked me one day, who's going to be my daddy? I'm like, you got to be kidding. I can't do that. And I was her father for all those years. This uh, August 1st, 2011, after being retired for a half a day, I walked her down the aisle. Hmm. One of my shows is coming up at the end. It's going to be Cross Country Killers. Cross Country Killers, all spelled with a K. You know what that's about? Not the train, but that is about... <laughs> I don't know if I really want to guess. <laughs> no, but here it is. I have to call an organization up and say, look, we need to build a partnership or I'm coming into your room just like this train is coming. And I said, <laughs> he understood it. And yeah. guess what? We work together. Do I believe in his beliefs? No. Does he believe in all my beliefs? No. But at that moment, moment, I formed a relationship of trust. Hmm. You give me what I want, I, in return, don't expose you. And guess what? You go and do your thing. I go and do my thing. And I thank you. When he said thank you, Mr. McFadden, that's fine. One of the best thank you cards I've ever received from any organization is from the Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. Really? I still have it to today, and I honor it because when I investigated that case, I'm African-American. Don't know any Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs African-American, but they saw 
what I needed from them, and I respect them, they respect me. Building honest, true relationships. This show will show you that people trust me more than they trust the average person. But why? Because I'm going to be that person that you can trust, and I'm not going to lie to you. So that's what the show is about. Hmm. Gary, we've got to go ahead and wrap, but I'll, uh, I want to let you go ahead and have the last word here. Tell us, what are your hopes? Uh, what do you want to see out of the city of Charlotte? Obviously, you've got a lot of experience here. You know the fabric of the city uh, as well as anybody else. Uh, in order to get back to a more... Um, I guess, peaceful time and have a, a more standard murder rate, hopefully none at all. But in order to see good community relations with police and, and the citizens, what, what do you hope to see? I hope we take ownership from every side of the city as though the Panthers had won the Super Bowl. And the reason I say that is <laughs> think of how the city is on fire and how much a unity and, I, and think of how much a love you see during Christmas. You will give up your parking space. Everybody's happy in the mall. You're speaking to kids. You're going to chocolate. Nobody's mad unless you can't buy the presents. So give me Super Bowl on Christmas atmosphere in the city. You think of how many people take ownership of Charlotte if we won the Super Bowl? Take that same ownership when we have the violence and let's address it. Hmm. And then, but be, but give me my space. If we come to that parking space the same, give it to me and we get out the car and say thank you. That's what I want to see. When you were in a grocery store, it's thank you. If you're pushing the buggy, it's thank you. During Christmas, we're happy in line. When we stand in line trying to get that last item, race, income, and and ethnicity never plays a part. Can we have that all the time? And let's work towards that. Thanks again to Detective Gary McFadden for sitting down with us at the Advent Coworking Podcast Studios. You can reach Gary on Twitter at Sugar Free Talk. I Am Homicide can be seen Tuesdays at 10 p.m. on Investigation Discovery. RSVP for the next live Discuss CLT event Thursday, August 17th at Lenny Boy Brewing Company on South Tryon Street. The topic is Charlotte Media Matters, and a moderated panel will discuss how the local media landscape has evolved and where it's headed. The event is free, but you must... RSVP at DiscussCLT.com. Remember to get in on the discussion by tweeting us at Charlotte Mag and using the hashtag DiscussCLT. We'll be back in two weeks with more from the DiscussCLT podcast. Until then, keep Charlotte regal, y'all. <laughs>